let's talk about why we're doing a talk on cardiovascular disease. We're going to talk, actually for the first few minutes, about my family history. We're going to talk about this, and you're going to watch a video, and you're going to see my dad on video and all that kind of stuff. See, I'm already out. But the reason that I have kind of swung back to more disease-specific talks, so next month we're going to be talking about how to beat Alzheimer's, how to, how to protect your brain from shrinking, basically, is that I really am not finding any compiled information about any one particular disease. So we're seeing a lot of bits and pieces, but to take it right from A to Z, or A to Z, what are we saying, Canada? Z, thank you. Okay. From, and I say restroom too, so I, I have no idea where I'm from. Oh, oh, that restroom is an American thing, right? So, okay, so sorry if I am completely messed up. But the, the bottom line is I want you to have a more of a global understanding about what cardiovascular disease truly is. Because I believe if you understand the disease, then when you read, because there's a lot of noise out there when it comes to investigating health issues. Am I correct? Yeah, there is a ton of noise, so how do you filter it? So if we can understand the, the, the concepts and, and how this has came upon us, then I believe the, the how of getting out of it and avoiding it and reversing it becomes a lot more logical. I'm a pretty simple guy. If we can understand the why and the how it, things are developing in us, then I believe that you, you're going to be your best advocate. You're not relying on somebody else to filter information. When you read something or hear about something, it's either going to make sense or not, and you're done. And you can move on, rather than ponder and wonder and you know all this kind of stuff. I'm, it's really, you're going to find tonight, cardiovascular disease is not that complicated. But unfortunately, if you take a step out into the mainstream world of cardiovascular disease, the confusion is monumental. And so what I'm going to try to do my very, very best is to focus on what I believe to be the five myths that are perpetuating cardiovascular disease tonight. If we can break down those myths, replace that with the truth, then what you can do is you can act on that truth so you can actually get some real, solid, scientifically based strategies that will give you real results. Which, when it comes to cardiovascular disease, means you don't go to an early grave. So that's a fairly important one. Okay. If, if that really doesn't matter to you, then probably tonight you, you can just keep playing Funny Bird or whatever people play on their phones today. So what we really need is we need real strategies. And even more than that, we need strategies that are sci scientifically solid in every way. And I'm a big nut about that. Okay. And this really hit close to home this past year when my dad had a heart attack last fall and he required quad bypass surgery. My family history is definitely slanted towards heart disease, but it doesn't have to be the final chapter of the story for any of us. So genetics can be overcome and that's why it's so important to understand these, these five myths because if you understand those, then you're not going to be paralyzed into thinking like the average Canadian does is, you know, genetics are mostly unbendable. We need to break that right out of our, our, our consciousness, but if that's even subconsciously where we stay, then it's going to be really hard to take positive action. So, in my dad's family, just again to give you the family history, my grandfather had his first heart attack in his early 50s. I was just checking the facts with dad there before we started. He figures it was probably about 55 or 56 that the grandpa had his first major heart attack. Then, I, I was under the impression that basically he had a decade of life, but, but Dad said he lived into his mid-70s, but was never the same. Um, all I remember as a kid was Grandpa got winded real easy. He sat in this big recliner, and he read his Bible a lot. That's, those are my memories of my Grandpa, which are not, they're not all bad memories. But the reality is, he could barely get up and move around the house without getting winded. And, and I thought it was for 10 years, but Dad said, no, it was pretty close to 20 years. That was the last 20 years of his life. And that is not, hey, if I'm going to clock out at 76, which I think is totally ridiculous, by the way. Um, but if, if I am going to clock out at 76, I want to be going right until the very end. It's going to be more like 106 or maybe 126 for me. But that's, that's the vision that I've got because I believe that's possible. So. 
graph, I just to give you a little bit more history there, he was a businessman, so no doubt he had his fair share of stress. This is another thing that I just cannot stand, right? Is this, you know, the whole idea of get some exercise and avoid stress. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, how do I do that, right? You know, so how to beat heart disease? Oh, get some exercise and avoid stress. Sorry, I, I missed that point. That was my, if I hadn't been reading my script, I would have got that, okay? So no doubt he had his fair share of stress, and although they ate from scratch, it wasn't, by our understanding now, it wasn't always healthy, okay? Uh, so you can eat from scratch and not necessarily be healthy ingredients, okay? In fact, if you looked at his diet, though, it probably wasn't too far off what the Canada Food Guide recommends. And, if we're, I, again, Dad could probably confirm this to me more, but I said to Dad, I said, I may not get all the facts right because I was just a little guy, but I'm quite sure he went to his family doctor fairly religiously, uh, follow the standard recommendations, so watch your stress, take your medications, stay away from salt and fat, and keep on keeping on. But basically the underlying message is your fate is set. You know, it's in your genes. It's just the way it's going to be, so you might as well get used to it. You know, and I'm guessing here too, but I would imagine he probably knew where his cholesterol was. Probably didn't eat a lot of eggs and a lot of butter, because grandma would have been on that. You know. Uh, you know, all the things that kill you. But in the end, he died far too young, and as I said, in the last decade of his life, really had no life at all, you know? So, fast forward to the next generation, okay? So my dad's 71 years of age, he's playing hockey over in the west side with his buddies, they're training for the BC Senior Games, and heart attack on the ice. And the Heart and Stroke Foundation actually did a movie on these guys because dad was the second guy on that same hockey team that dropped from a heart attack. Our team is the Ogopogo Seniors. We play out of the District of West Kelowna rink. I suppose if you're recording it on video, you might want to speed up. Video a little. <laughs> no slap shots, no body checking. <laughs> However, everybody gets a little carried away every now and On a really good day, we're mediocre. Dennis Savage, defense. Dave Jenkins, defense. Steve Berry, goalie. We're not kids. Minimum age 55. They said uh, Steve, the goalie, was the first one to get to me. It was a very fast game, and Dennis was looking to come off the ice, but he wasn't able to right away. As the puppets clearing our end, Dennis skated in front of me, and just... I had collapsed. Uh, my heart had stopped. <sighs> Six minutes worth. There was... Five or six rotating doing the CPR. Three shots of the defibrillator. Then finally, he came back. I couldn't believe that uh, it did happen to me. I happened to be playing that day as well. It was an absolute miracle to see what happened with him. Never expecting that I would be uh, the next one on the list. I skated back near Steve to pick up the puck. I felt just a slight bit dizzy. He just went straight down. I seen Steve drop his gloves and uh, get down to him. We rolled him over and there was that, that look and the lack of pulse and the lack of breath. After the first shot, they said, I became alert, uh, opened my eyes. The next thing I remember is the uh, force of the guys doing the CPR on my chest. They had this under control within two to three minutes. I thought it was absolutely incredible, particularly the response of the guys themselves. They've taken it upon themselves to get trained in the AED. They've purchased their own portable unit and frankly saved both their lives. In all our facilities, our municipality has taken the step to make sure we have AEDs available. At first the guys were laughing, saying, Steve, both these fellows have decided you can rescue me. 
why you not to play on your team? I said, no, I'm two for two, people survived. Oh, dump and chase, that's no good. We're too old for that. We took it for granted that, oh yeah, bring the machine out, sit it there, babysit it. And last March, we had to use it, it took out its own life, and my gosh. Pretend that we're EMTs or paramedics. We're just hockey players that took some training. And it was the electric shock that uh, was needed in order to bring me back again. Well, I'm really grateful that uh, a group of our guys make it, a, make it a point each year to get uh, upgraded on CPR and the AEDs. We've been married 52 years and we're looking forward to like, quite a few more. So I'm very thankful to have been where I was when it did happen and those around me. <laughs> so we're very glad to have that. Mm -hmm. You know, and it is really amazing, you know, that those old guys have trained themselves and they've gotten their own defibrillator and it's just awesome, you know. Um, so you're thinking, well, of course, it's just genetics in action, right? That's that's a, that's just what it's going to be for my dad and, and now me, right? Well, you know, I want to go through a little bit more of kind of their story, and I apologize, mom and dad, that you've got to listen to this, but uh, it's you know, from my observation, now I've got to put my doctor's hat back on, you know, because I look at them, and I look at a lot of your generation. You know, um, and I see lots of home cooking, lots of home cooking. You know, maybe eating out a little bit more than maybe the previous generation, because restaurants just didn't exist, right? You know, you think about your parents' generation, and if they never had money, right? You know, too busy trying to survive the depression. Um, but you know, and as long as I've been a chiropractor, that's been getting adjusted. Um, he takes vitamins. Some seasons of life will ramp up more than others, you know, but they're fairly conscious, you know. Um, so for the last 20 years, mom and dad have been doing really, really well. You know, uh, they exercise a lot, and you know what? Most people, including myself, look at them and they go, they look far younger than their 70 plus years. Far younger, you know. Um, this is the fact that he's out playing hot at 71, now 72, he's back on the ice, by the way, you know. Uh, so, if what I'm about to say tonight is true, then why would my very own father have a massive heart attack? Right? That's because that's you're, that's what I'm asking myself after I get the phone call and I'm sitting in the emergency room going, "What is going on here? This is not supposed to happen to my dad." You know? But after I kind of stepped back and you know the surgery happened and all that kind of stuff, I really thought about this. I'm like, "Okay, what is going on?" 20 years of doing things, pretty amazing, you know? But, you know, what I really had to come to the grips with is there was 50 years before that, you know? Um, and really, it's only been the last two decades of life that they even knew what to do. And, and that's when they started developing a plan. And so, you know, for the last 50 years, for the first 50 years of my dad's life, my parents, I haven't asked them, but I can assume that, you know, they, they just assumed that their fate was in their genetics. You know, their nutrition was really no different than, than other conscientious eaters, you know, um, other than, you know, kind of most home cooking Canadians. They never got adjusted other than maybe a few times a year for pain. They exercised occasionally. I remember dad jogging in the backyard, getting in shape basically for hockey season. But other than that, not, not too much. It was all about just making sure he was ready for hockey. And so that kind of behavior makes perfect sense if your genetics is the final chapter. If, if, if you have no control over the, your genetic expression, you know, because why bother? Why, other than staying out of pain, you know, why work on your health? Especially if the outcome isn't going to be any different than working your hind end off for years and years. Kind of painting a big picture here, aren't I? <laughs> okay, you know? But, you know, 50 years of Canadian lifestyle will set in motion a fairly predictable outcome. You know? But, or, you know, do this, do 
going to do this. Oh, no, I'm going backwards. Let me see how big. Okay, all right. So how big is big? Well, it, when we're talking about heart disease, one in two Canadians will die of heart disease. One in three will die of cancer. In fact, researchers are saying that our Canadian lifestyle is responsible for upwards of 80% of the current disease we're struggling with. So if you factor in diabetes, depression, uh, the, the digestive issues and all that type of thing, 80% of disease that we're currently suffering with that's plugging up our billion dollar block, our hospital, that is 80% lifestyle. Isn't that crazy? That is wild. So following the healthy recommendations of mainstream, mainstream nutritionists, doctors and personal trainers, trainers will not get you the life you deserve. I guarantee you that. I see it every day. People working hard, working really hard, and getting dismal results. One of the 40, did you realize that that stat, 40,000 Canadians, every year their first sign and symptom of heart disease, including my dad, is the massive heart attack that kills them. And if they don't have a buddy with a defibrillator within two minutes, he's gone. We're at his funeral instead of at, in the emergency room. 40,000 people, their first symptom is their last symptom. I'd say that's a little too late. Okay? Right. So tonight is not about parroting the recommendations of mainstream nutritionists or from the media or Health Canada. It's really about looking at our desired outcome. 100 plus living and working backwards. So living to 100 years, possibly even beyond 100 years in great health, and not just physical health. I'm done with us, you know, emulating the body as the be all and end all. We have to have loving relationships. So that means the people that we love have to live long with us. Right guys? Yeah, that's kind of the point, you know? I want my wife and kids to be super healthy as long as I'm on the planet. I want to enjoy their presence, that's a big deal for me, right? So, loving relationships, incredible attitude, and a joy-filled, rewarding life. It's not just about living to 100, or whatever your number is. 110, 120, whatever that is. It's got to be in loving relationships, great attitude, joy-filled life. That's what we're going for. So we're going to topple the first and second myths, right off the bat. Okay? So we are completely off the mark when it comes to blaming dietary cholesterol, in saturated fat for heart disease. And for an in-depth study on the science behind what we're going to touch on in myth number one and myth number two, look to, so for the next one, look to Chris Pressler's. You can get this book free online. Okay, so Chris Pressler, Diet Heart Myth, probably about 30 pages of just research. In fact, you might put you to sleep, but it's a great research-driven book. It's a what they call an e-book. You just go to his website, download the book. You might have to punch your email in there because that's how they get their email, your email list so you can actually buy stuff from them. But you can unsubscribe from its thing after you get the book, so it's not a big deal. At least that's what I did. Um, so that's the first book. And then the second book is uh, by this Ulf Ravant something. Um, anybody with uh, Russian heritage can pronounce that name for me? Okay. Um, he is actually a, an MD with his PhD he completely breaks down the diet cholesterol myth, right? And so his book is called Ignoring the Awkward, How the Cholesterol Myths Are Kept Alive. So we've been told for the last 50 years that we need to avoid red meat, eggs, and basically any or all fats, especially the saturated fats. The media has shouted from the rooftops about it's all about cholesterol, and when you control your cholesterol intake, you're on your way to beating heart disease. But the truth is, and this is really important, I'm going to read some research here, your body tightly regulates the amount of cholesterol in your blood. When cholesterol in the diet goes down, your body simply manufactures more. I'm going to block these notes, by the way. Oh, yeah. um, your body simply manufactures more. When cholesterol in the diet goes up, the body makes less. In cholesterol studies, now really listen, you've got to listen to this. In cholesterol studies, volunteers that are fed two to four eggs a day, these studies show that dietary cholesterol has very little effect on blood cholesterol levels in about 75% of the population. Or well, maybe you're just the 25% that it really stinks to be you. The remaining 25% of the population are referred to as hyper-responders. And these hyper-responders do see an increase in blood cholesterol when dietary cholesterol goes up, but it's modest and it does not affect the ratio of LDL to HDL or increase the risk of heart disease. Next slide. 
So the truth is you can stop flushing your egg yolks down the drain because cholesterol is the wrong target. So how about saturated fat? In 2010, the Journal of Clinical Nutrition did a meta-analysis, so I know everybody knows what a meta-analysis is, that looked at, oh, I'm gonna explain what that is. Uh, so basically what they do is they take every study that's ever been written and combine the results. It's probably one of the most accurate ways to get to the truth because you basically zero out all the ups and downs and you know one's, one researcher wants to prove one point so their study shows a certain way. So literally, this, what this meta-analysis did is it went across the board. Everything we got, we're gonna compare. So this is what they found. Out of almost 350,000 people, the studies ranged anywhere from following for five years to 23 years. Is this too much science? You guys okay with this? You don't mind this stuff? Okay, all right, okay. So, so anywhere tracking from five to 23 years um, follow-up, there was 11,000 deaths from either, out of those 350,000. 11,000 deaths from either from coronary heart disease, so that's clogged arteries, you know, or stroke. The researchers concluded, this is what the researchers said after examining 350,000 people, 11,000 deaths, the researchers concluded that the intake of saturated fat was not associated with an increase in coronary heart disease, stroke, or cardiovascular disease. So it, there was no link. There was no link. Yes, there were people that died from heart disease, but it had nothing to do with their how much cholesterol and saturated fat they took. Huh, okay. And that and if that's not enough, Ansel Keys. Does anybody know who Ansel Keys is? We talked about him about five months ago. Ansel Keys was the actual founder of the diet hypothesis about dietary fats causing heart disease. This is what he said in 1991. So this is in the mid-50s when he was a young researcher. They researched that and he said, oh yeah, uh, you need to decrease your fats or you're gonna die heart disease. Well, Ansel Keys in 1991 said in a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine, and I quote, dietary cholesterol has an important effect on the cholesterol levels in the blood of chickens and rabbits. But many controlled experiments, oh by the way, are chickens carnivores? Do they eat meat? No. How about rabbits? Bloodthirsty rabbits. <laughs> no! They're vegan, right? They're vegan. They're created vegan, okay? Anyway, this, that's just my brain going off. Sorry, I'm off script here. Okay. So anyway, so it causes problems if you feed cholesterol to chickens and rabbits with their natural habitat and consume a ton of cholesterol. So that's my sarcastic voice getting out. But, but this is what he's saying. But many controlled experiments... That wasn't a quote, by the way. That's, sorry. Okay. But many controlled experiments have shown that dietary cholesterol has limited effect in humans. Adding cholesterol to a cholesterol-free diet raises the blood levels in humans, but when added to an unrestricted diet, it has minimal effect. And the, the quote went on to say that even though a cholesterol-restricted diet, when you increase your cholesterol consumption, it goes up for a time being, but then the body self-regulates and stops producing cholesterol, like we said before from the research. Okay? So Ansel Keys is to the diet hypothesis like Darwin is to the theory of evolution. That's how big he is in, like, in the world of cholesterol. And he's saying, guys, whoa, chickens and rabbits make sense. Humans, no. Okay. How about Sylvan Lee Weinberg? In 2004, a journal of the American College of Cardiology, former president of the American Cardiology and American College of Cardiology, I can hardly say all this stuff, an outspoken proponent of the diet heart hypothesis said, so this is 20, uh, 2004, the low fat, high carbohydrate diet may well have played an unintended role in the current epidemics of obesity, lipid abnormalities, type 2 diabetes. This, this diet can no longer be defended by appeal to the authority of prestigious medical journals. So, the real cause of the cardiovascular epidemic, if you've been reading, so we're going to get to the solution now. Okay. If you've been reading any of the alternative magazines, like Pathways or Live Magazine, you guys ever pick up Live when you're in a nature's fair? Yeah, good read, grab it, right? Will not surprise you guys, but the real culprit for heart disease, cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease, and stroke is inflammation. Now follow me here, because this, I've just kind of beat up on cholesterol and wiped out 70 years of myth, okay? So let's really figure this out. So, and it's the inflammation from our modern day lifestyle that's causing our endothelial linings to attract cholesterol. So listen, the inside layer of our blood vessels are covered with a specialized layer 
of cells called endothelial cells. And like any tissue, inflammation markers act like battery acid and destroy these delicate cells. They're really, really delicate. So cholesterol is a major component in wound healing. So we're coming back to cholesterol. Okay, because I don't want to leave that because I don't think you guys believe me yet. Okay. So it's hard to erase 70 years and 17 minutes, but we're going for it. So cholesterol is really critical in wound healing. So when this inside layer of tissue is damaged, cholesterol is laid down to begin a healing process, and that's a normal healthy reaction. So of course we're going to find loads of cholesterol in the plaque deposits inside arteries of the average Canadian if they're in a chronic state of inflammation. But saying cholesterol causes heart disease is kind of like saying firemen cause fires because every time you drive by a house fire, there's a whole bunch of firemen around there. You tracking with me now? Just because cholesterol is found at the scene of the crime doesn't mean it's the cause. It just doesn't make sense. Firemen don't cause fires. They're there to respond to the damage that the fire is causing. Just like cholesterol is only at the site of damage, and cholesterol is at the site at in the plaque, in the artery, in response to the damage. The body's only doing what comes naturally when it's damaged, trying to heal. Artificially lowering cholesterol, cholesterol levels does not prevent, prevent heart disease. It's the wrong target. We need to deal with the inflammation. When we remove the inflammation, the body will not need to put a scab on the damaged tissue because the tissue is not getting damaged in the first place. So what causes the inflammation in our bodies? Would that be an interesting thing to figure out? Okay, all right, so next slide. Okay, we're gonna hit the top ones, the acid addiction. So we're talking about inflammation and basically just the battery acid in our bodies. Okay, so I know a lot of you have maybe looked at a pH and nutrition and these kind of things and acids, base and all that kind of stuff, but we're gonna just kind of topple the things that really cause excessive inflammation. So white flour, white rice, white pasta, white sugar, you notice any similarities there? Yeah, table salt. Okay. Not sea salt. Salt is not the enemy. Sea salt is fine. It's, it's got minerals. Your body can deal with it. You know. Uh, excessive caffeine. So more than two cups a day. So you can come talk to Justin twice a day. That's no problem. Right. But then you need to rehydrate. You know. Um, so caffeine really can dehydrate if you're not rehydrated. One or two cups a day, you should be okay. Right. But any more than that, you need to be rehydrated. Alcohol. If you're a social drinker, you need to know that alcohol is pure sugar. OH, that's the chemical composition of alcohol. Pure sugar. That's why it's so damaging. Well, other than you should be out and about after you drink. But you know what I mean? Like that's that's why it's so like if you look at all the really super healthy, like all these paleo workout buff guys, they're not doing alcohol anymore. Because it's pure sugar. And they don't want that in their system. So um, again, you really have to rehydrate if or after. You have a drink? Okay, now let's get a little bit back from that. So we talked about the acid addictions, the points, the caffeine, the alcohol, the stress response. What does that have to do with inflammation in your body? Well, if you're constantly stressed, your body's angry. Your cells are not happy. They're mad. They're fighting mad. There's neurology that is, that is behind this. There's endocrinology, so your hormones are messed up. You know, it's just absolutely crazy. But talk about this. So over-exercising, so the difference between the Canadian recommendations, we're going to talk more about this, not next talk, but next talk, um, in, in the spring, but the Canadian recommendations of the three to five times, half an hour, you know, you know, exercise to a sweat, all that kind of stuff, totally, totally stress response producing. The World Health Organization, different exercise recommendations. They talk about an hour a day, every day, 45 minutes of that would be like a, a brisk walk, so you're not really sweating, but you know, you're you're going, and then 15 minutes you sweat. That's very different than going to an exercise class and you know working your butt off for an hour, like most ladies do to keep trim and fit and all that kind of stuff, right? You know, you think about the five to seven times that they program into your go to the gym, pound out, pound out, no, go for a walk, do some hills. You do Knox Mountain every day, you're covered. But that doesn't get you into gym membership and have you buy a fancy pants and all that kind of stuff. So anyway. But see, authentic health is really simple. It's really simple. It doesn't have to be fancy, you know. Poor sleep. So one of the things that I talk to people about is really limiting your carbohydrate consumption after 2 p.m. Because carbohydrates are for people who want to run marathons. So you have a big pasta dinner, 
And so you get all charged up for a marathon. So unless you're not running a marathon, take carbohydrates because your body gets all charged up with the carbohydrates. Whether you feel it or not, you are ramping up for burning calories. And if you don't burn the calories, guess what? Everybody loves this part. Where is it? What happens? It gets stored as everybody's happy cells fat. Right? So yeah. So you know, no carbs after 2 p.m. unless you're training. Okay? If you are more physically active, if you're training for a run or a marathon or a triathlon or doing something more physically, then yeah, you have carbs in the afternoon, but that's because you're training. Blood sugar dysregulation. So this is basically, um, in fact, I've got a, um, um, a blog on our website on the five or seven keys to uh, great sleep. So if you want to kind of learn more about if you're having str struggling getting to sleep, I've actually wrote a blog post on the website, lenderstarmer.ca, um, about how to get great sleep. Uh, the other one too, insulin and leptin, nutrition hack number two. So that's something we talked about last month. Again, blog post on the website, everything's right there. So basically what I do after these talks, I'll break this down into five blog posts and they'll be on the website. Okay, so that's why I was saying to, um, Judy, um, when uh, she was starting to take notes, I said, you know what, I'm just going to block it so you can just get it all. So, um, so cross neurological signals. This is where I could, this is crazy. This is crazy stuff. Your amygdala and your hypothalamus will cause you to be in a chronic stress response if your posture is putting pressure on your spinal cord, so hard bone on a soft nerve, you guys have heard me talk about this before, right? But you have a postural abnormality, either from you know being at a desk for years and years and years. Some of the people I see with the worst possible spines are accountants. They've got horrible, horrible spines because they've been in front of a desk all their lives, right? Accountants, teachers, any sort of that kind of desk jockey world was really brutal on their spine. Their spinal cords are beat up. They've got worse looking spines than guys that have worked physical labor. It is really crazy. It's hard to get your brain around that, but the reality is that seated posture, that forward posture, it erodes the spine. So, but we're talking about the amygdala and the hypothalamus. Those are two deep brain centers that those um, those unhappy signals that are coming from your spinal cord, from the poor posture, whether it's an impact or whatever that is, will actually stimulate a chronic stress response. And so, even though you might be laying on the beach, relaxed brain is still in a chronic stress response and so you still have angry cells your body's still ramped up it's still inflamed or behaving like it's inflamed on the inside see that's why we talked about this being beating cardiovascular disease from the inside out okay because it's about an inside job okay so our current so that's so that's uh number one number two number three we're on to number three. This is number three. Okay. My goodness. I'm doing a very good job of staying on my notes and no one's throwing anything at me. It's all your fault. <laughs> so, okay. All right. So can we get to the next step? Uh, okay. Myth number three, okay, is that it is all about your cardiovascular system. You know, you'll have to go with me on this one because this, I tell you, this has been ingrained in our culture because we've got a specialist for this and we've got a specialist for that and we've got a specialist for this. Right? So we're all separated into a cardiovascular, you know, if you have a heart attack, you see, who do you see? Cardiologist. Right? If you break your bone, you see an orthopedic surgeon. Right? If you have a muscle tear, you go see a sports doctor. If you have a GI issue, you go to a gastroenterologist or something like that. You know, and you've got, you ladies have a special doctor. And what I don't understand is why that's a guy, but anyway, whatever. Um, but you know, there's there's um, um, doctors that specify in uh, your genital, reproductive, and so it's all separate. Okay, so that's how we've done it. Brain, emotions, you don't go to the same guy to talk about your emotional stuff. It's a whole other office. So that's a whole other city. Right? And they don't really talk. None of these people talk about one another. They don't get together on Saturday and say, what are we going to do with Charlotte? No, you have four different specialists, and they never communicate. And you know, it's not just because we don't have good enough software. Okay, it's the way they're educated. You know, they're these pillars, all standing under their own. Right. So anyway, so our current system of disease management and symptom care will always trump taking a deeper look. Right. Deal with the symptoms. See you later. Next. Boom. Right. So just like blaming the fireman for a fire, 
it's equally wrong to blame our cardiovascular system for all the heart disease in Canada. Remember what I said earlier, we're here for real solutions, not just superficial stuff, right? And based on our current results in Canada with heart disease, we're missing something huge. So we've oversimplified the condition, and as we've already seen, the very experts who came up with the theory are saying, hold on a minute, there's more to the story. Okay, Ansel Keys, the, the, the College of Cardiology president, you know, saying it's crazy. Okay. Um, so, go with me for a while. So, let's say the lights in this part of the room, or maybe the lights in this whole room, whatever. You know, and then at the same time, we realized that the appliances that were plugged into the receptacles, there was no power going to any of those. Just in this part of the room, and everything over by Justin, everything's fine over there, right? Okay. So I don't think there would be anybody that would jump up and ask Justin, where's your box of light bulbs? And we better call an electrician to change out those receptacles. What would you guys do? Thank you. Yeah, you'd go into the electrical panel. Does that make sense? Sorry if I didn't make the story clear enough, but yeah, you would go to see if there's a breaker that got flipped because obviously that's what happened if this region of the building is shut down and all the receptacles, it's not a light bulb problem and it's not a receptacle problem, okay? So our current cardiac strategy is to focus all the attention on clearing out the arteries, throwing the person back into their destructive lifestyle, never really dealing with the root cause of the problem. We never really ask the why. Why is this happening? We focus on the what, never the why. But to understand the why behind disease, we need to understand how your body, the cardiovascular system in particular, was created. So, we don't really have much of a clue what happened from two half cells to 21 days of life. We don't understand that part of it. In fact, I read this really great article just this week. I was hoping they would have a little bit more info for me. It was from the University of Michigan, a brand new article um, University of Michigan Medical School, and it was called the 21 days, the first 21 days of life. And I'm like, finally, somebody's going to give me some insight. It's been 20 years, I've been looking at this stuff, and nobody's told me what's going on, right? They basically said, we don't know much about what goes on between day one and day 21, but if anything happens to that embryo during those 21 days of life, you're hooped. That was it. I'm like, oh, okay, I kind of knew that. So basically, we don't have a clue, but from the beginning, see, what happens? is at 21 days of life there's a switch and you go from completely undifferentiated cells, just every cell's the same, to a rudimentary nerve system. And I think I talked to you guys already about this at Maxine's, right? Can we talk about this? You know, it's, it's just absolutely amazing, right? And then, so, do you have the next slide there, Ron? Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so, um, so from the beginning though, so this rudimentary nerve system, from that point, see this is where I get really excited because this is your whole body, right? Did you notice? I'm like, oh, yeah. okay. So from the beginning, your nervous system, at least the first system that we can even identify in an embryo, creates everything, okay? So that's where this term innate intelligence, how many people have heard that term, innate intelligence? Yeah, and sometimes it's kind of like tossed around, kind of airy-fairy, all that kind of stuff. But the way that I use this term innate intelligence is that intelligence that's streaming across those rudimentary nerves right from the beginning, because innate means it's kind of inborn. We don't really, can't explain it all, you know? Um, but, so this inborn neurological intelligence that creates every cell, tissue, and organ from, uh, from undifferentiated cells from three weeks of life on. But it doesn't leave you the day you're born. This is, this, this is the key that frustrates me to no end. Right? Because as parents, we don't really need to do anything. I've got three kids and I'm amazed at just how well they're growing up, thanks to the mother. Um, but all we really need to do is just supply these babies love, quality food, clean water. You know? It's really, and guess what? 18 years later, you know, 30, that's what they're saying now. I don't know where they come up with these numbers because 10 years ago it was uh, 70 trillion cells, but now it's 38 trillion cells, at least according to Wikipedia. And, you know, of course, Wikipedia is totally accurate because just anybody can edit it. <laughs> like, I, guys, okay, this is a rant, okay? This is a total rant from a left brain guy. I'm like, we use Wikipedia like it's the gospel truth and anyone can edit it. So if you don't like what Wikipedia says, Charlie, you can sign in and change it. <laughs> I was listening to a TED talk from a CBS reporter, and she gets even more upset about this. this is, I'm sorry, this is a total rant. I'm coming back. Okay. So she was talking about how 
there was a one of her um, friends who was an author, quite well known author, right? Was trying to edit something on his profile. So he's so famous, he's got his own section in the Wikipedia. So he's trying to edit it, and the the editors at Wikipedia, somewhere wherever they are, kept changing it back to the wrong information. <laughs> so he's trying to change it, trying to change it, trying to change it. You know, he finally gets in touch with somebody at Wikipedia, and this is a TED talk. You can watch this. It's, it's you know this is, and you know what they said to him? He wasn't considered an expert on the topic. Of himself, <laughs> you know, so, so they didn't let him change it, and I'm just like, are you like? Don't trust the internet, please. Not that, not that much, okay? Not that much, but anyway. Um, okay, so back to the, I'm coming back. Okay, back on script. Okay. okay, so it doesn't. This innate intelligence doesn't leave you on the day you're born. Um, so really, 38 trillion cells, according to Wikipedia. Um, 11 organ systems, according to Moore's Anatomy. My Four and a half inch anatomy textbook from chiropractic school, so we know that's ready to go. Eleven organ systems, all under the control and coordination of the nerve system. But we behave that as soon as we pop out, that intelligence is gone. You know, so what do we do? We start injecting our babies, putting devices through eardrums, removing critical portions of the immune system like appendix and tonsils. Right? I guess it's true, appendix and tonsils, right? Um, before we even hit puberty. And so this is, you know, we tinker add this chemical, take away organs or organ parts, and, and really all we're doing was, is messing with an intricate organ system that we really know very little about. You know, and we wonder why we're not living to our potential. And we kind of feel ripped off or disappointed when our body seems to fail us. You know? uh, the truth is, if we focused on removing the interference to the nerve system, continue to provide the essentials like daily physical activity, quality food, water, you know, the body would look after itself quite nicely. It's created as a self-healing, self-regulating organism, right from day one, or at least from day 21, or at least when we understand like a tiny bit about it. But, you know, let's go back to checking the breaker panel, you know? So why wouldn't checking the breaker panel to see if the power is on to the cardiovascular system be on our top three to-do list when it comes to actually preventing heart disease from the inside out? You know, it doesn't make any sense to do that in our homes. You know, you don't call the electrician and have him root around and take stuff in and put stuff in and all that kind of stuff, you know? So it makes even less sense to me, it makes even less sense to do that with our bodies. We need to make sure that the power is on to the cardiovascular system, because the cardiovascular system does not have the innate intelligence to create or recreate cells that the nerve system had a hand in making from day 21 on. You guys with me? I know this is a colossal leap for the average Canadian, you know? But maybe you just need to shut this off? And listen here, does this not just make more sense? Your nurse system had a hand in creating the whole deal and when you popped out at nine months, that didn't stop. Even though our culture behaves like it did. Okay, so, sorry, I didn't, I didn't want to seem like angry or upset there, but that's, it's really frustrating when I think our whole strategy for, you know, we're, we're going way out here and we've missed the foundation, right? It's kind of like how I think kids are learning math these days, but anyway, that's a whole other thing. That's another job. So, um, so, so we're quick to blame nutrition, stress, and outside forces, but we don't take the time to assess the master system, the nerve system, and the system that powers our entire cardiovascular system. We've lost the belief in our body's healing from the inside out, and we put our trust in chemicals and surgeries. That's what I see anyway. You know, and it's quite possibly one of the most arrogant positions we could ever take. We actually believe we know more than the inborn intelligence that created our bodies in the first place. I actually believe God put that power in our body, but I'm not trying to convert folks, that's just what I believe. God put that power through that nerve system. That's that's my zero to twenty-one day solution. <laughs> God, right? So anyway, so you can plug in whatever your solution is, but, um, and you know what they say about pride and arrogance? <coughs> what do they say about pride and arrogance? You guys know? It comes before fall. And how are we doing with cardiovascular disease in North America? I'd say we're stumbling and tripping an awful lot, you know? Um, and so myth number three is that it's all about the cardiovascular system and we need to look no further. You know, so that's a simplistic view of the human body that really doesn't serve us, but
but does have us popping pills at an incredible rate. You know, we're smarter than that, but it takes thinking differently about how the human body works to break free from these arrogant beliefs. You know, okay. And number four. Okay. I've wanted to do a talk where I can show a slide of Arnold Schwarzenegger for 20 years. Finally, it's happened. Okay, so I know I was really stretching it, but anyway, that's what. So myth number four is that we're all physical. Okay? So more and more in the literature, we see research cropping up about how our emotions play into our physical health. And even more important than the literature, we just know that's true. You see it. You see people that are depressed, and where's their health go? Up or down? Or down. You see people that are optimistic and hopeful, and where, their, where does their health go? Up. Oh, yeah. So our current health philosophy was based on separating the mind-body connection. Again, I believe a very arrogant position because we have no idea how powerful that is. But modern day society has elevated arrogance to monumental proportions. So I think we've got that covered. You know? The truth is our emotions do far more with our health outcomes than our genetics, a diagnosis, or even blood work. There's many cases in the scientific journals where people literally believe themselves back into beating cancer or some other life-threatening issue. Okay. A study in the U.S., they followed 100 people who were diagnosed terminally ill. So they were told they were going to die. Twelve years later, they were still alive. They had all used different treatments, some conventional surgery, chemotherapy, some alternative, like special diets. Some had used psychological techniques or religious practices, prayer, these types of things. What they all had in common was an unfaltering belief that what they were doing would work for them. Nicholas Hall. George Washington University Medical Center found that his patients could believe their way into increasing the number of circulating white blood cells. Dr. Frank Wallace, University of Texas, found the same. Doctors in Japan at Yokohama, uh, yeah, the tire company, uh, City University, uh, showed that 84% of subjects, this is why, 84% of subjects could eliminate the standard histamine response to poison ivy. That the itching and swelling and blisters disappeared when patients imagined the poison ivy to be a harmless plant. And then, yeah, and then they switched it. Large number of subjects broke out in blisters when they reversed the experiment and imagined the harmless plant to be poison ivy. Isn't that one? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Dave Spiegel, he's a doctor at Stanford University, conducted a study on a group of women with breast cancer. Half the group received the latest medical help, the other half of the group had belief training. After a year, the second group reported much less pain and more optimism. Ten years later, the second group had lived an average of twice as long as the first. Okay? So belief is huge because I believe it commands the brain to take charge of our physical reality. Now from what I've read and what I've seen with working for people for 20 plus years, you know, I believe that changing our emotional and our belief centers engages what Seth Godin calls the reptile brain, so that base kind of keep me breathing sort of brain. And it convinces your body to recreate some of the exact same healing and recreation pathways that we have during embryogenesis. So remember I said that from 21 days of life onwards, I believe that that rudimentary brain somehow can reactivate that recreation cycle. I, I can't think of how belief would, you know, and in a physical sense, we can get all metaphysical and talk about, but in a physical sense, we do have conduits, right, that are still connected to every cell tissue and organ in our body, you know? And so that's kind of, the way I explained it in my limited understanding. So it's a base survival instinct that really has no rival. A survival instinct, instinct that even beats terminal disease, according to the research. You know? Unless, of course, all that research has been edited by Wikipedia people. And then we really don't know. Then we're all just, we might as well just, yeah. Okay, so myth number five. So myth number four is that we're all physical. Myth number five, so we're coming in for a landing. Our last myth is that we can do it alone. How many people remember this ad? Yeah, exactly. The Marlboro Man. Western Frontier. Right? Absolutely. Taking on the world by himself, right? Okay. Some call that the American dream, but you know, you might be able to get away with that for a weekend. Or maybe a season of life to kind of unplug yourself from, from every everyone else, right? But University of Texas researchers have shown that quality relationships decrease your chance of disease. Social relationships, both quantity and quality, affect mental health, health behavior, physical health, and mortality risk. So what does that mean? You just live better and way longer. That's what that means. 
right? So, but seldom am I going to flip it. Do we look at relationships the other way? We talk about you know positive, encouraging, healthy relationships, but what about toxic relationships? It likely doesn't, likely doesn't surprise you that toxic relationships, you're opening yourself up to more than just hurt feelings and frustration. Okay? Northwestern University study that joined force, forces with preventative medical departments all over the U.S. Like there's literally 15 preventative, I've got the, the list of you know, places that participated in the study. They showed that high levels of social strain dramatically increased your chance of heart disease of all types. Okay, so that's cardiovascular disease, that's stroke, everything, right? So the study showed a high level of social strain caused, and we're going to define that in a minute, you're going to do a quiz, a 12 times increase in coronary artery disease and a 10 times increase in stroke. Those are astronomical numbers. 12 times and 10 times? That's huge, right? So the risks were independent of education level, marital status, or family income. Wow. So what causes high levels of social strain in relationships? Next slide. In the research study, the participants were asked to rate the following statements. So I, I'm gonna, we're going to stop for a minute and let you guys do this quiz. Okay? So the questions were, do the people who are important to you get on your nerves? Second question, ask too much of you. Third question, do not include you. And the fourth question is try to get you to do things you don't want to do. So this is how they scored the study. They said zero if it doesn't apply. One, two, three, four, five. Five is worst case scenario absolutely all the time. Yes, 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 yes. So what I want you to do is just mentally go through that list again and score yourself. Do the people who are important to you, so what I like as far as a definition is that the top five people that you hang with, that's probably people that are important to you, okay? So the top, top five people that you hang around with, do they get on your nerves? Zero if it's no, all the way up to five if yes every single time I'm around them. I'm going to pull in the little hair I have. Okay? okay? Second thing, ask too much of you. Do not include you. Try to get you to do things you don't want to do. So you kind of, do you kind of have a number? Okay. And this was shocking for me because I look at my relationships and I think they're fairly healthy. But this is what they said. A high level of social strain so social strain that causes a 12 times increase in coronary artery disease and a 10 times increase in stroke. A high level of social strain was identified as a score of seven or more. A low level of social strain, which did not cause those diseases, was a score of four or less. Four or less. So when I read that and I ranked them, I can't say I'm under a score of four. And I look at my relationships and I go, I've, I've got this. I've worked hard to get the joy sucker writers out of my life and just be around people that are supportive and mature and positive. Ah, four. Or less. So it's time we take our relationships super serious and get toxic people out of our lives. Because you deserve a long and healthy life. And allowing people to take you down is literally killing you. Now this doesn't mean you don't help people that are hurting. Really get clear on this, okay? But Dr. Henry Cloud talks about this in his Boundaries books. We need to move the joy sucker outers, you know who I'm talking about, okay? The joy sucker outers to the outer circles of influence in our lives. So it doesn't mean that, you know, you never, ever, 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 ever talk to these people or try to help them or, you know, but you need to move them into the outer circles of influence in your life, and you only allow mature, healthy, uplifting people into your inner circles, the areas of greatest influence. So that may make for some uncomfortable conversations, some unanswered emails and text messages, and some different plans for the holidays. But you need to remember your life depends on it. Take this seriously. And for you guys who have been on the planet longer than me, I'm probably preaching to the choir because you've done it the hard way probably 
and put up with somebody far too long and you know it's affected your health. You maybe just didn't know how much. Am I right? Okay, I'm getting some shaking hands here, yeah? Yeah? Okay. So, recapping our five myths. One, we're completely off the mark when we blame cholesterol and saturated fat. Number one and number two. We need to tackle inflammation. Third one, is it's all about the cardiovascular system and we need to look no further. No, your nerve system is the master system and it needs to be free and clear to do its job. That is the foundational system for every other system. Okay? Number four, we need to work on our believer and our attitude because we're not just all physical. And number five is that I can't do it alone. And the Marlboro man is dead, not just because he was smoking. Right? He did, he died. In that you know, imagery, he died from social strength because we were built to do life together. Right? And the toxic relationship literally are killing us. Okay, so our next talk, is on avoiding Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so if you want to protect your brain, again, guess what? We're going to go completely counterculture. The, the actual recommendations for the heart disease prevention is actually causing a lot of the rise in Alzheimer's and diabetes. Pretty wild, eh? So if you follow your doctor's recommendations, if he follows mainstream recommendations, that most of them do, then you are actually opening yourself for Alzheimer's and type 2 diabetes. That's it. You know, so that's you. You won't want to miss that one because honestly, I have not heard anybody give a half decent talk about creating Alzheimer's. It's crazy for how huge it is. There's like radio silence, right? Radio silence, right? So, and if there's anybody here that doesn't know how their nervous system is doing, then really listen up. Okay, so. That's where we come in as chiropractic, as a profession. Okay, so if you've got an incredible chiropractor already, awesome. And I don't just mean a nice person. Okay, there's a nice person, but delivering clinical excellence. So this is what clinical excellence means. Because never before has it been so critical to be on the leading edge. Because there's more hitting your body than ever before. You need a healthy nerve system. You need to know exactly where your posture is going. And you need to be doing what it takes to correct your extracts. So you need a great chiropractor to orchestrate that. You can't just get that by watching videos on YouTube okay, and doing some exercises. It'll help. No, I showed you guys some videos on YouTube, or at least where to go. You know, it'll help. But you need to unlock that master system. And there's way too much noise out there in the health field to not have somebody on your side that can sift through that stuff. Never before in the history of our planet have we had so much chatter. Right? Does it get confusing? Like, honestly. It's easier to go shop for a car than to just figure out what to do for your health. You know, and are there more brands of cars than there ever have? Well, maybe 20 years ago there were more brands, but you know what I mean, right? Yeah. It's way easier to go buy a car than it is to figure out what to do for car seats. You know, because there's so much noise, right? And so what we've done is we've actually put together some forms here, and if you want to have a nervous system assessment, then all you do is put your name, your phone number, and an email, circle a time and a day that works for you, and Lacey, not today, not tomorrow, next week, she'll pick up the phone, and if that time works, then she'll confirm that with you. And you just tear off that bottom, and it'll hit the day and time, right? And if not, then she'll talk to you about a time that does work, but it'll at least get us an idea of what works best for you. It takes about anywhere from 40 minutes to an hour. We call it a discovery visit in our office. We sit down and go through whatever tests that we do, you know, um, and, and you'll find out what's going on. You'll know where your nervous system is, right? The next thing is the Stay Connected one. Maybe I've got a couple of, uh, next one? Next one. Oh, there we go. Five minutes revisited and avoiding Alzheimer's. And here we go. Okay. Stay Connected. So some of you just kind of want to still stay at arm's length, which is fine. That's why I do this. I want you guys to learn and, and, and know that there's a place that you can learn and that we're filtering a ton of information and, and we're getting that information out to people as, as best we can, you know? Um, so if you just want to find out more about what we're doing, I've mentioned a couple of blog posts on our website. So that's lighthousecaro.ca. So that's that's that. We will do office tours because you know we, we're talking to a lady today, her mom, elderly mom, just petrified about seeing another professional. So we just said, well, you know what, just bring her in and we'll just kind of tour around the office and she realized that we don't have you know, multiple heads, and we actually did care about people. And sometimes people just want to walk in, 
see what we're like and say, see you later. You know, and just check us out. I'm okay with that. You know, I'm totally fine with that. So our office is over in Landmark Number Four, so you can just come and check us out. You know, Facebook. I don't know if you guys are big Facebook fans, but we throw a lot of stuff up there. I threw two or three references to the research that I'm prepping. Every time I prep, I throw a lot of the links up on Facebook. So if you're into Facebook, you like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, that's more video based. And then finally, if you want to sign up for our blog post or our 100 plus living newsletter, so that basically is when our next 100 plus living talk is going to be, where it's going to be, and what the topic is going to be. So again, that's that bigger page. And so if you want to be on that, then you just check that. But we do need your name and phone number and email. And we are not going to broadcast your email everywhere. I am crazy, crazy, crazy about when somebody gets my email address without my permission. I just cannot stand that, right? So we guard our email list. And there's some pretty big legislation that just came in at the beginning of the year too. We have to do that as businesses to be really, really, uh, it's like a personal health information. You know? We just can't broadcast that stuff. We have to have permission to contact you, right? So that's that. And then very, very soon, I'm actually gonna be launching my own personal site that is basically my own professional. There's gonna be Lighthouse Chiropractic, but then there's gonna be actually me, Dr. Graham Jenkins, that is 100plusliving.com. So that's not up yet, but that will be there. And that is likely where most people will be getting you know, blog feeds, blog posts, new videos, all that kind of stuff, because I'm finding that we can't get a website to be my office that's kind of like finding out about us and how we do what we do in chiropractic, because it just gets overwhelmed by the amount of content that I create. So I really mess my websites up. In fact, the first one I had, it crashed because it just there wasn't enough bandwidth because I was just putting out way too many articles. It was like this ever-expanding university thing, and it just died. And the guy just said, you're just way overboard and whatever. And I'm like, but I'm just creating articles. You know, I'm just doing this. You know, but after five years, I guess it doesn't do that. So, um, Is that the one you know called Wikipedia? Yeah, yes, yeah. It's not part of Wikipedia. It just kind of amoebaized into Wikipedia. Okay. All right. So that's all the content I have. And I would love if you guys kind of, you know, something lit you up. You know that you can take and and start to do tomorrow. You know that would be awesome. You know. Um, I don't